Schneider. Protests on the rise on behalf of the organizing team of the conference protests on the rise. Um, as you can hear, I have a few issues with my voice due to the soccer match last Sunday. Um, it was kind of frustrating for me and for everybody in this room. Um, <laughs> those who are mentioned, uh, who are talking off. Um, let me all welcome you to this conference. As you all know, this week is about, basically and primarily, is about dialogue. About international dialogue between Germany and Spain concerning a topic we've all heard of, not only in the last months, but also in the last years, that is two crises. Migrant crises, of which all uh, countries in Europe are affected of, um, primarily Germany, and financial crisis um, that's um, been initiated about 2007, 2008, and reached its peak in 2011. And as a consequence of political consequences, we can see right now um, with the uh, um, appearance of movements and parties such as in Germany the AD, Pegida, or in Spain um, Podemos, for example. Um, today is some kind of the formal beginning of our conference. I've seen a few faces uh, around here yesterday, and as you all know, we've had a little introduction into the, the crisis in Spain and had the Spanish um, perspective, uh, if you like. And we're going to continue what we've begun yesterday with um, the perspective from both Spain and also Germany on other aspects. And I hope that this will lead us to a fruitful discussion, not only today, um, not only within the four walls of this room, but also, as I hope, um, the next uh, the next hours and in the aftermath and the next days and maybe even uh, the next weeks or months. Uh, I don't know. So um, I don't want to lose too much words because it has already proceeded. What uh, again, Mokrini uh, has uh, talked about a little bit. It was kind of a cultural accommodation. We wanted to start at uh, 3 p.m. and it's uh, uh, 3.15 or something. It's very <laughs> We're getting better in this, and I'm very, very happy that this uh, really relaxing attitude towards time. Uh, yes, Dr. Vanes, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted briefly to thank the organizations who made all this possible. Yeah, that would be the day and day for financing this conference. Then the European Commission, of course, for hosting us uh, today in this marvelous place, thank you very much, and then the uh, universities involved, that would be Universidad Francisco Vitoria and the Technical University of Chemnitz. Thank you very much, and uh, Jochen, please. Thank you very much uh, to you as well, Adrian and Tom. Uh, thank you very much for choosing this uh, Sala Europa, our European House in Madrid, for this conference, which uh, I think is, is very timely and, and uh, of course uh, Protests on the rise is the issue in uh, political science at the moment, I think. Um, congratulations for this one week program, which is very dense, uh, very interesting, uh, and which will, if I understand correctly, result in the elaboration of strategy papers for the German and Spanish governments. Okay, on this. Uh, if I could have a copy, I would be very happy to have them. Uh, I think that's a, it's a, it's a wonderful idea, which results in something very concrete. Um, before presenting the two keynote speakers here on my left and right, I will take three minutes for three key messages from my side, okay? which then the two key speakers can start deconstructing happily okay, after, after me. First of all, uh, yes, populism is on the rise. Uh, we, we know that. But, and this is maybe my optimistic perspective, uh, might be touching its limits in Europe at least. Okay. Um, those politicians with a simple solutions to complex issues, who do not care too much about details or even truth, well, we've all heard and seen about post-truth, uh, 
uh, alternative facts and the like. C, politicians who often mix with a high degree of authoritarian uh, or even narcissist, narcissist uh, leadership style, hmm, if you think about uh, even inside Europe, Hungary and other places. And D, in my opinion, politicians with messages that split citizens in two clear camps. On the one hand, you have the people and the anti-people, or you can say pure citizens versus a corrupt elite. Okay? Uh, always in a confrontation is what they try to, 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 to dibujar, huh? to, to, to paint a picture of, of, of confrontation and a fight, mm, resulting in two things, in protectionism against what we would like to promote, which is open societies, and secondly, which not always, but often also results in outright racism. Okay? We have examples, of course. Uh, the Brexit is an example of this tendency, uh, including the racist side of it. Uh, we have in the United States Mr. Trump. We have uh, Mr. De Wilder in, uh, in Holland. Uh, Mr. Hoffa in Austria. We have in Germany the AFD and the elections at the end of this year. We have in France Le Pen or even for the protectionism side, Mr. Mélenchon, etc., etc. Second mes message. So populism, yes, but hopefully limits in Europe have been reached. Second message, it's mainly our fault. It's mainly the fault of the others, of the other politicians, of those who are not populists. Why? Because they don't counter populists efficiently. They don't have the clear message. Uh, they are not convincing enough. Uh, and don't offer and implement those solutions which defend what we have in Europe. In this open societies, promote integration, uh, the respect of the other, and show that positive economic and social policies can go hand in hand. So put plainly, um, non-populists have failed to transmit convincing messages and the populists have managed to do so. And the third and final message uh, which helps justifying my salary okay, uh, comes from the EU because we think the European Commission uh, has made at least a good analysis of the situation and is at least trying hard to convey these messages uh, back uh, and to, to, to fight against uh, these, these populists. Now it's true that we don't manage to convey the messages maybe as effectively as we, as we would like, but that's subject maybe of a different seminar, how to communicate on Europe, can we do this alone from Brussels, or do we need national governments, regional governments, to carry the voice of Europe also inside their countries, uh, which I think is a must, because otherwise Brussels will not be able to communicate to people on the streets in Spain. Um, but at least we try. Our answer to, to Trump is more trade. Trade with rules, a rules-based trade, which protects our, our, our principle of uh, precautionary principle, that we don't want to have uh, unchecked products in our markets uh, who are maybe harmful for citizens, consumers, harmful to environment. No, we don't want that. We want to have the scientific proofs before putting something on the market, but we want free trade. So free trade with rules. And we have replied to this after Trump, who wants to do more protectionism. We go out, we want to do trade agreements, with, we have done with Canada. We want to increase it with Mercosur, with the South of America, with Japan and others. The second answer, our answer to the authoritarian regimes and governments uh, Putin, Erdogan, but even inside Europe, huh? Hungary, uh, Poland, and so on, and so on. We denounce these their, their, their failures and their stances. We even put on sanctions, huh, if you look at Russia. But, and I think this is important, without breaking the threat of dialogue, which we think we need to keep these channels open and to ma maintain our influence on them and on their actions, so we don't cut these threats. Our answer to Brexit, more EU cooperation in areas where the Brits have actually blocked us up to now. So we have proposed a white paper on the future with different scenarios, five scenarios. Do we want to go backwards? Do we want to have different speeds? Do we want more integration? 
And this white paper, which looks at the general picture, will be followed by five mini papers on different aspects. Today, just today, we have presented a paper, a strategy paper on the European social pillar. How can we strengthen social rights of Europeans? This will be followed by economic and monetary union, defense paper, a very important subject, a paper on globalization and how should we deal with it, including demographics, climate change, robotization, what are the right answers to this? Um, and, well, as you can see, I'm not, not a pessimist. Um, and when some have said that 2017 might be the annus horribilis no, of Europe, well, maybe it will be a turning page, 2017. Um, if Macron wins in France, uh, in, in Holland we had already a rather positive result. If we manage to negotiate with the UK on good terms, start good negotiations, if we come to a working relationship with Trump, that is correct. Uh, the German elections, I think, is not such a big problem because there's two main contenders uh, who are both pro-European. And if the economic, if the economy continues picking up and we start also to strengthen social rights, fighting inequality, which in my opinion is the main issue today in economic terms, and we stay open and do these free trade deals with other countries, then I think 2017 can actually be a positive turning point for Europe. Up to here, now to our speakers. Um, Professor Dr. Louis Simon, director of the Brussels office of the uh, Elcano Royal Institute, which is the most prestigious think tank in Spain, and currently at the Free University of Brussels. A cosmopolitan with a PhD in politics and international relations from the University of London, and studies also in Sciences Po in Paris. Teaching and researching also in London, Tartu, Estonia, New York, Washington, and Paris, who has worked a lot on the EU and EU-US relations, but also on NATO and geostrategy and defense issues. Very well placed to speak about his subject today, the many crises of Europe. And then later we will turn to Professor Dr. Mario Schneider, Professor Emeritus of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and currently visiting professor at the UFV in Madrid also cosmopolitan, but by birth, rather. An Israeli citizen born in Argentina, currently residing in Madrid. A political scientist with just 40 years of teaching and research experience, not only in Israel, but also the US, the UK, Chile, Italy, Costa Rica, Spain, Argentina, and Mexico. And he has worked enormously on the fascist ideology and the rise of this ideology in different nations, on anti-Semitism, on related issues like nationalism and collective identities, on human rights, the Israel-Palestine conflict, the question of Jerusalem and the Intifada, and also a lot, among many other things, on Latin America and specifically democ democratic transition in Latin American countries. His keynote is entitled Coping with War, Economic Crisis and Migration. So let's start with right. Professor Pablo Simon. Thank you. Thank Yep, okay. Now you can hear me better. All right, so, well, good afternoon. Thank you, Jochen, for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, and let me start by thanking the organizers for uh, such a fantastic initiative and, and for the invite. Uh, and for those of you coming from Germany, which I guess is many of you, I uh, hope you're having fun in Madrid. Uh, and for those of you who went to the game, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as a Barcelona supporter, uh, let me quote our friend Donald and say that it was a beautiful thing uh, on, on Sunday. Um, but, but moving on to, most, uh, to more uh, serious stuff, not that Barcelona winning Madrid is not serious enough. Uh, I, I've been asked to, uh, to talk about uh, the many crises of Europe. Uh, 
and what they might mean for European integration and for European security more broadly. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to give you a Spanish perspective. In fact, what I'm going to try to do is give you my perspective on the U.S. perspective on Europe. And I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I, I think speaking about Europe's many crises uh, uh, is both easy and challenging. It's easy uh, because ever since the global financial crisis uh, broke out like nearly a decade ago, uh, Europe has been hit by one crisis after another. And, and Jochen has already alluded to some of them. Uh, we've had a debt crisis, we've had an economic crisis, we've had an Arab Spring gone bad, uh, we've had a Crimea slash Ukraine crisis, we've had a migration slash refugee crisis, we've had a wave, a wave of populism that isn't gone yet, uh, we, we now have a Brexit crisis, and we also seem to have some sort of Trump crisis, which I will get to in a minute. So, quite a ride for, uh, for less than 10 years. Uh, in, 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 in a way, it's, it, it almost feels as if Europe and crisis have become two associated concepts in our minds uh, as of late. Uh, so, uh, that, that makes it easy to talk about Europe and crises. Uh, but, uh, but talking about Europe and, and crises, or Europe's crisis, is also challenging because, well, for one thing, we've lost count on the many crises that have unfolded uh, in and around Europe in recent years, uh, but also because it's not quite so easy to sort of discriminate uh, amongst the crises that matter, uh, those that don't matter that much, uh, and those that matter a great deal. And I'll, get, I'll try to sort of unpack that statement. Uh, we know that most media and expert commentary sort of tends to fo focus on, on, on the daily fluctuations, if you will, uh, of each individual crisis. Uh, uh, however, I think, and this is sort of going to be my pitch, I think that it's important to set Europe's current crises uh, uh, against the backdrop of broader systemic uh, geopolitical uh, transformations. And in particular, I want to highlight two main trends, two structural trends, if you will, that uh, I believe are very much intertwined and that are very likely to have a pervasive impact upon Europe's uh, uh, geopolitical development. And they already, they're already having it, in, in, in fact. The first one is the ongoing shift of the world's center of geostrategic and geoeconomic gravity uh, towards the Asia-Pacific region, away from Europe. And the second, uh, uh, and you can of course challenge uh, all, all these parameters and we can talk about that later. And the second is the progressive shift or rebalancing or pivot, however you want to call it, and we can get into semantics later, uh, of, uh, of US geostrategic priorities towards the Asia Pacific region. And, and it's sort of concomitant retrenchment uh, from, uh, from Europe and its immediate surroundings, including the Middle East. And there are many obstacles on the way of the US rebalance towards the Asia Pacific, and we can talk about those as well. But I believe that the rebalance is it, it's, it's, it's a structural development that, I mean, it, 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 may, it, it may proceed faster or slower, that, and that's debatable, but, but, but it is happening. Uh, I think these sort of two processes are intertwined because the shift or pivot or rebalancing of America's strategic resources and attention towards the Asia Pacific region is explained by the fact that the world's wealth and power are themselves shifting towards Asia. So to put it graphically, if you will, the US military is simply following the money as it should do, as militaries do, as empires do. I think these two processes, uh, meaning the shift of global wealth and power towards the Asia Pacific and the shift of America's geostrategic attention towards the Asia Pacific, are likely to have an impact upon Europe's position and relative importance in the world, both economically and strategically, but also upon Europe's own structure and cohesion, or lack thereof, if you, if you prefer. Uh, perhaps we can talk about Europe's geopolitical and strategic position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world and, and, and about what the so-called Asian century might mean for Europe uh, later on. But what I want to do during the rest of my presentation uh, is actually focus on, on Europe's internal geopolitical configuration if you will. It's, it's balance of power, or the lack of a balance of power, if you prefer. 
Uh, first, just by way of, uh, of you know, to, to, to sort of clarify, let me just say that as a form of policy prescription, the balance of power has traditionally sought to contain any state or group of states from dominating a given regional system, in this case Europe. Ever since the end of uh, the Second World War, the balance of power in Europe has been lar largely underpinned by the United States, as we know. A strong US military, diplomatic, and economic engagement, forward engagement on the European continent, has provided the foundation to keep other great European powers at bay and to get all or most of Europe's key powers, and also the smaller powers, of course, to buy into this concept of a liberal and multilateral geopolitical and economic order on the continent. Um, I think this sort of principle of a liberal order uh, 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 found its institutional expression uh, in both NATO and the European Community slash Union. And I'll get into that in a minute. I think these two institutions, NATO and the EC, and later the EU, have historically gravitated around a US engineered uh, liberal concept for Europe. In the sense that these two institutions, and I'll get into the history in a minute, uh, these two institu institutions were originally conceived of uh, uh, to sort of help underpin a balance of power in Europe after the war. Uh, and uh, in particular, I would say the United States, and again, I I'm trying to give you the US perspective uh, because, well, I, my, my main area of expertise is US foreign policy and, and US strategy in Europe. Uh, in particular, I think the, 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 the United States understood that the, the preservation of a balance of power in Europe required engaging with Europe's two main powers, Germany and Russia, because no other country in Europe had, uh, and again, we're not, getting, we're not getting here into discussions about the political systems, ideology, foreign policy orientation, just as a matter of raw power, no other country in Europe, uh, from a US perspective, had or has the resources to, dump, to potentially dominate the entire system. Uh, however, the United States followed after the war and continues to follow today very different approaches and very, a very different strategy towards Germany and Russia. As far as Germany is concerned, America's strategic objective has been its integration, its socialization within the, 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 the liberal order, the West. Uh, in fact, I mean, this approach uh, has been so successful uh, not, not, not least because of Germany's own inclinations, that during the Cold War, West Germany would soon become uh, one of the key engines of European prosperity and of European security. And this is actually even more, uh, more the case today in the post-Cold War uh, uh, period, in the sense that Germany has become the cornerstone of the liberal order in Europe. Uh, uh, in, in, and this is probably even, even truer today in the context of what's happening in the United States and with Brexit, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, now, in contrast to that, the approach followed by the United States towards Russia and, and by the West more broadly towards Russia has typically revolved around deterrence and containment. That was the case during the Cold War and that remains the case today. Um, now, as I was saying, both NATO and the European community and later the European Union were uh, uh, initially conceived of again, from a US perspective, uh, there are different things from, from different perspectives, as institutional agents at the service of these broader geostrategic ends, uh, if you will. NATO, as, as we know, had three main purposes. Uh, first, the first one was to facilitate Germany's rearmament and integration within the West. The second was to contain a potential Soviet expansion into Western Europe. And the third one was to provide a permanent mechanism for U.S. engagement and U.S. leadership in Europe. Uh, and, 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 and as we know, U.S. leadership uh, was and remains a central feature of NATO. Uh, now, getting to the, Euro uh, let, let me move on to the European community. Uh, I think the European community uh, and, 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 and later the European Union, and, and again, the European community means many things to many different people. And I'm just talking here from a strategic U.S. perspective, from a sort of big picture balance of power perspective. Uh, I think the European community and later the European Union would also contribute to this sort of broader geostrategic objectives 
uh, of, in, in particular, uh, by facilitating Germany's socialization within the West and making Western European countries economically and socially and politically resilient enough to resist Soviet political influence. I'm not talking about the military side of things. Uh, and I think if we look at the contemporary regional geopolitical picture, actually, this is not only a historical feature, uh, in the sense that today we can see that the European Union plays a key and often actually forgotten uh, strategic role in Europe, namely by making Central and Eastern European countries economically and politically resilient. Uh, we talk a lot about hybrid warfare and sort of nonlinear warfare, <laughs> political warfare, that sort of thing. Well, the EU is actually playing a a very important systemic role in terms of underpinning stability in Central and Eastern Europe today. Uh, now, it's true that the United States never actually took part, at least directly, in the European integration process. However, it has played a key supporting role all along, both directly and indirectly. Directly in the sense that, as many of you I'm sure no, uh, the United States linked uh, its post-war economic aid to Europe, the, the Marshall Plan, which we all know about, to intra-European cooperation, to regional cooperation. And indirectly in the sense that it was actually the United States uh, 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 who came to the realization that in, in, in a post-war context, that empowering Germany economically, politically, and militarily uh, was critical to Europe's prosperity, uh, economic prosperity, political stability, and defense. Even if some Western European countries, in particular France, actually had reservations about anything having to do with empowering Germany. This is a historical fact. Uh, and let me just mention two, uh, two, two examples that I think illustrate how important the US factor has been in the context of European integration, not just European security, but European integration. So let's, for instance, let's journey back to the immediate aftermath of, of World War II. Uh, as you know, not only was Germany divided between East and West, but West Germany itself, in the immediate aftermath of the war, was itself divided uh, between an American, a British, and a French sector, each with its own currency and administration. And, and as the Cold War was beginning to emerge in the late 1940s, the United States believed that the consolidation of West Germany into a functioning single uh, administrative and political unit, its reindustrialization and its militarization were critical if the Western effort to contain Soviet power in Central Europe was to be successful. And France was actually on a very different page and insisted repeatedly that West Germany itself, I mean West Germany, should be kept divided, deindustrialized, and demilitarized. In a way, I think we could say, and some historians say it, that cooperation with West Germany was forced upon France by the United States uh, in an environment in which France's foreign policy choices were constrained by strategic decisions made in Washington. The 1949 Schuman Plan, which as you know is the embryo of the European integration process, was a pragmatic and effective solution to French concerns about German, West German power. As you know, under the European Coal and Steel Community, West Germany would surrender uh, control over the industries of the Ruhr Valley that had allowed her to outperform uh, France industrially and overrun her militarily twice in the recent past. And I think we need to bear in mind that the Schumann Plan was a French construction, even if then other Europeans bought into it, but it was initially a French concept and that its chief purpose was to mitigate, from a French perspective, West Germany's influence. Now, if you fast forward, if you fast forward 40 years or so, when the Cold War order collapsed, France, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union made it clear that they opposed German reunification. But they could not prevent it from happening. And, and, and the support of the United States uh, uh, to the reunification process proved critical to its success. The United States and, of course, the German people, obviously, which is where the initiative was coming from. Now, once, once the French realized that German reunification was inevitable, 
they insisted on the need to sub substantially expand the powers of the European community to tie down, and this is French language, a reunified Germany within a multilateral setting. It was this French concern that gave way to the Maastricht Treaty, to European Monetary Union, to political union, to the common foreign and security policy of the European Union. So we had a situation after the end of the Cold War that sort of mirrors uh, the end of the Second World War in the sense that France, of France opposing the idea of empowering Germany, whether it was West Germany at the time and unified Germany uh, at the end of the Cold War, of the US supporting that idea and pushing through that idea and of France reacting by emphasizing the potential of the European integration process to mitigate and even contain uh, uh, German, German influence which the French have always been very concerned about. Now, uh, just apologies for the long introduction, but I just wanted to give you some sort of elements, geopolitical and strategic elements, uh, uh, to, to sort of help contextualize uh, Europe's contemporary crises, uh, or rather to help situate Europe's crisis in singular, uh, because I think the main crisis in Europe uh, that Europe is facing today is a balance of power related uh, crisis. Now, this balance of power related crisis, which I think uh, uh, is a sort of multiplier in the sense that it aggravates many of the other crises that we have around, uh, the sense that there is no anchor as there used to be, I think is animated by three main trends, three main developments. And again, I think we need to look at the centers of power in, in contemporary Europe. And the centers of power in contemporary Europe have not changed much in the last 70 years. There are three main centers of power in Europe, the United States, uh, Russia, which a historian uh, Paul Kennedy calls the flank powers, the US and Russia, and, and Germany. Um, so uh, as I was saying, I think this sort of balance of power related crisis that Europe is experiencing today uh, uh, sort of revolves around three main developments. One is US strategic retrenchment from Europe. The second one is Germany's consolidation as the EU's undisputed economic and political leader. And the third one is Russia's push to recreate a sphere of influence in parts of Eastern Europe. Now, each of these trends is more nuanced than they might appear at first sight. And each of them is riddled with its own internal contradictions. Uh, for instance, starting with US retrenchment, I think the United States is unlikely to abandon Europe anytime soon. In fact, Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 may well preside, in fact, it is presiding over a partial US strategic re-engagement in Europe. However, as US military power decreases in relative terms, the need for establishing priorities, geographically, geopolitically speaking, becomes increasingly apparent. And this is a very, a very heated debate in Washington uh, these days. And for all the importance of Europe, which will remain very important to the United States, or for that matter, the Middle East, which will also remain very important to the United States. I think recent developments in US force posture and US defense strategy suggest that the Asia Pacific region is indeed rapidly becoming the Pentagon's main area of priority. And that means uh, that US leadership uh, and, and that America's position in Europe is unlikely to be what it used to be. Uh, second, just a couple of points on Germany. Uh, uh, it's true that Germany has been uh, emerging uh, uh, in, in the last few years, not, not least uh, uh, through the light of the financial crisis, as Europe's sort of uh, center of gravity, as the EU's center of gravity. Uh, uh, although so, perhaps sometimes even in, involuntarily, in, and, and that Germany is a rather reluctant leader in, in many ways. Uh, and, and I would say that Berlin's projection as a great European power is, is limited in itself by the constraints inherent to the European Union, where decisions need to be constantly negotiated with multiple partners and with multiple institutions. Uh, but it's also limited by, by, by Germany's own aversion, not only to military force, but also to political leadership or to overt political leadership, and also by Russia's own resurgence, which represents a check a potential check, and actually a, 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 a quite a problematic one potentially, on German power in Eastern Europe and on Eastern European security as well. Uh, and finally, Russia's own geopolitical comeback, if you will, uh, is itself limited by that country's own internal contradictions, economic and demographic picture, 
and geostrategic liabilities, not least the fact that it has to compete on two you know, hot fronts, Europe and Asia, but also Central Asia, actually. Now, those sort of stipulations notwithstanding, I would personally argue that U.S. retrenchment, that the ascent of German influence within the EU, and Russia's attempts to recreate a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe are the defining features of today's Europe. And they are likely to have pervasive effects upon Europe's evolving geopolitical order. Yes, there are many crises around, but I think we should, I mean, or at least from an academic perspective, I would encourage you to keep your eyes on the ball and, the, and look at the balance of power crisis that sort of shapes the context in which the other crisis unfolds and mediates their impact upon our economic, social, and political well-being. Now, so in, in, in this context, and, 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 and I'll, I'll conclude soon, I think if we want to understand the evolution of Europe, geopolitically speaking, one key factor that we must keep our eyes on is US policy towards Germany and Russia. So let me give you a few thoughts on that. Uh, now, I think as the United States rebalances towards the Asia Pacific region and retrenches or downsizes, whichever term you prefer, in Europe, its ability to preserve its influence and power in Europe, which is something that the US is not giving up on. I mean, the US wants to maintain as much influence as it can in Europe with, uh, with, with, with as low an effort as it can. Uh, and its ability to maintain a substantial degree of influence in Europe will depend to a great extent on whether it gets its Germany and Russia policies right. And this is something the Americans are well aware of, I would say. Uh, now it's interesting because it seems like America's Germany and Russia policies are currently undergoing a period of adaptation and are in fact subject to intense political debates within the United States itself, particularly if we look at the Trump administration. As you know, President Obama's vision uh, for Europe revolved around embracing Germany's leadership role uh, in the European Union, in embracing the notion that Germany was America's main European partner, and adopting a hard line against Russian revisionism in Eastern Europe. However, both during the campaign and uh, his first weeks in office, Trump seemed to signal that he would revise that approach. He referred to Russia as a potential partner in the fight against terrorism and radical Islam, even labeled NATO as obsolete during the Republican primaries, as you know. And perhaps most shockingly for all of us, I think, he referred to the European Union as a vehicle for Germany accusing Germany of taking advantage of a grossly undervalued euro to prop up its own experts and to exploit, and I'm quoting Trump, the United States and the rest of the EU. Uh, not, not only that, and, and Jochen already alluded to this, but Trump even praised uh, Britain's decision to leave the European Union. He promised to give the special relationship between the US and the UK a new leash of life and even started an informal conversation with Theresa May on a bilateral US-UK FTA, free trade agreement. So this sort of contrasts with Obama's repeated pledges for EU-US uh, cooperation, or Obama's assertion that Britain exited, uh, if Britain exited the European Union and wanted a free trade deal with the United, Sta with the United States, would have to go back uh, uh, to the back of the queue. Um, now, I know uh, Trump, the Trump administration is now in the process of backtracking uh, from some of its uh, initial statements on Russia, on the EU, and on, 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 on Germany, and on NATO. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether Trump's flirting, uh, I think at this point, whether Trump's flirting with Russia, its support of Brexit, and its swipes at Germany or the European Union are part of a negotiating ploy, whether he wants He's looking for leverage and wants something in exchange, which seems to be sort of his you know, uh, frame of mind, uh, or whether they represent a sincere intent on the part of the United States to turn the European order on its head, or at least as far as US policy is concerned. Uh, it's also unclear whether Trump will manage to impose his vision uh, for Europe 
uh, within its own, his own administration, given how much resistance there is to change within the U.S. government, especially in relation, in relation to Russia. And perhaps we can come back to the, um, to the U.S.-Russia discussion during the, uh, during the Q&A. But let me just take the last few minutes um, to offer a few thoughts on, on U.S.-German relations and on the question of what an unstable and equivocal U.S. attitude towards Europe might mean for German foreign policy and for Europe's geopolitical order more broadly. Just a couple of thoughts. And please do take everything I say with two or three pinches of salt because uh, we're now entering highly speculative terrain. Two minutes, okay. Um, so, as you know, uh, Germany is in a pre-campaign mode. Uh, and according to the polls, Schulz uh, uh, may well give Merkel a run for, for her money. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. You know that Schulz is, was the president of the European Parliament. And he's running on a tough on Trump, tough on Brexit, soft on Russia, deep on Europe platform, if you will. Uh, 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 as far as uh, European integration goes, he seems to favor a more supranational, ever closer union direction, although it's, it's not quite clear what, what that means exactly. Uh, Merkel is tougher on Russia, more conciliatory on both Trump and Brexit, and more cautious about European integration. Supportive, yes, but uh, she seems to favor more of an intergovernmental approach to economic and political cooperation. And perhaps Jochen can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, having said that, Trump is very bad politics in Europe. He's very bad politics in Germany. And so, and so, and so is Brexit. So even if Merkel's instinct might, might be to mend fences with both Trump and even Brexit, uh, she will have to play that very carefully. In fact, as we get closer to the election, the pressure for her to criticize Trump, to criticize Brexit, will only grow. Uh, but that might change after the election, assuming that she wins, in the sense that I think Merkel is aware that the United States played a key role in underpinning German political unity and European integration. Uh, 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 she said as much during her joint press conference with Trump at the White House last month. Uh, she's therefore aware that Germany's and Europe's uh, security and Germany's own influence is actually embedded in that sort of broader U.S.-led Western security and geopolitical framework. And she also seems to be aware that if Germany, or for that matter the European Union, were to break with the United States, they'd be leaping into unknown territory. And that showing loyalty to the Western framework is a pre precondition for German and European security political stability and influence. And if I have one minute, I will say that showing loyalty means three things uh, from a US-German relations perspective, if you will. The first is about making sure that German and European economic and security policies are in sync with those of the United States and do not undermine US interests in Europe. Uh, this seemed to be the, the, uh, the, the focus of the first Trump-Merkel meeting. And there are three important issues here, trade, NATO slash defense spending, and, and, and Russia. Um, perhaps perhaps I'll, 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 I can unpack those during the Q&A. The second is about making sure that the European Union continues to develop within the bounds of the broader Western framework. And that's where the, also where the uh, TTIP conversation kicks in. And the third one, uh, is about finding a way to accommodate Britain in, in a post-Brexit Europe and to fashion a, e, an EU-UK relationship that is acceptable to London. As far, I think as far as Berlin is concerned, Brexit is an issue that matters in two ways. It matters in itself and it matters to the extent that it matters to Washington. Um, just to wrap up, I'll say that U.S.-German relations, EU-U.S. relations, and Brexit are all very tricky issues, as we know, which sort of constitute the geopolitical superstructure, if you will, of the NATO, TTIP, and Brexit conversations. Uh, my sense, and this is my sense, perhaps Jochen and, uh, and Mario disagree, and we can talk about that later, my sense is that Merkel is actually prepared to make concessions on all three fronts, but that there are also limits as to how far she can go. Uh, first, as already argued, the idea of making friends or being nice with either Brexit or, I mean, with either Trump or May 
or, or, or Brexit Britain is unpopular in Germany as much as it is unpopular in Europe. Secondly, uh, that idea uh, is also particularly unpopular, I would say, uh, in, in the rest of Western Europe. And the French, I think, are likely to complicate Germany's picture uh, 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 on, on Brexit and, and, uh, and Trump. And finally, uh, even if we were to assume that Germany or whoever, I mean that Merkel or whoever is the next German chancellor is ready to compromise, there is no, no guarantee that, that Washington would, would not keep uh, blackmailing if, if it perceives that it, it has been a successful strategy. So all in all, I would say that, uh, uh, that, that Merkel is going to have to play a very careful, almost impo impossible balancing act on Trump, on Brexit, on NATO, and on TTIP. And I'm, I'm talking about Merkel because she, I mean, she holds the key or, uh, to, to, all, to all of those conversations as far as the European side is concerned. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this uh, very rich contribution. And I think there's a lot of questions which could come to your mind. Uh, please. Time for questions. Anything you commented on? Um, yes, over there in the back. Um, what's the role if uh, France and other countries in Europe decide to have another policy towards the proper European Union? And with that I mean um, having another type of uh, politics, more isolationism, uh, with only thinking about their countries and not thinking about the whole Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Should I take the one by one? Take oh, one by one. So, thank you. That's that's a very good question and a very timely question, although in a way it comes uh, one week late, if you will, in the sense that it seems as if things are going to be fine uh, on the French front. I mean, well, you cannot bet the house on it, but it looks good. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. I think that can complicate, I mean, that would obviously complicate things. That would obviously, I mean, I'm talking here, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a sort of great power perspective. Uh, so from the, through the lens of what I've been discussing, and in particular, I think from, from Germany's perspective, uh, it, would, it would be a, a very serious complication. I mean, especially if, that, if, if it comes from France, right? I mean, Germany is facing potentially a very complicated picture in the sense that you have the Brits and the Americans pushing from one end, then you know what's going on in Central and Eastern Europe and so, or some Central and Eastern European countries. And then if on top of that, uh, France, uh, uh, France, you know, uh, sort of falls off the, the, the European wagon, that would be almost an impossible picture to manage for, for Merkel. Uh, but it but it looks as 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 if it's going to be to be fine on the French on the French populism front. I mean, it's going to be bad because obviously, uh, um, uh, even if Macron wins, which uh, seems to be seems to be the case, uh, you cannot ignore the fact that over forty, I th believe it's it was forty percent of of French people voted for openly anti EU. Uh, uh, candidates, so that's that problem is certainly not going away. Uh, I mean, that's that's there, and that's going to complicate. And the thing is that 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 sort of level, which is uh, more the societal level, if you will, uh, uh, and and other you know related crises that I, that I was alluding to earlier, uh, they 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 mix up with with the sort of uh, the balance of power related crises that I was that I was discussing. And, and, that's, and, and, and that's where the problem lies, right? Because if you have, if you have an unstable uh, geopolitical picture, then those, all those crises can ignite like a real mess. Could, could one argue that Trump has created a certain uncertainty mess and so on in terms of global issues, but has actually helped the EU internally? in, all, in yes. the way of fostering convergence inside the European Union? 
I think one could argue that, and people are in fact arguing that. I'm just not sure I buy it myself, but, but, uh, but, but I think you could argue it. I mean, I buy it to, I, I buy it to a point, right? I mean, I think we're, all, we're always looking, uh, in the EU in Brussels, we're always looking for, for external catalysts that will, you know, uh, trigger uh, uh, a, a, Europe, a truly European reaction and would get us to realize that we have no option but to, but to get together because things are so bad. And, and, and I think that's fine. I think crises do indeed uh, have helped the European integration process historically. But, uh, but I think, I mean, if we're talking, I mean, I don't know what we're talking about here, but if we're talking about, for instance, uh, greater European defense cooperation, which is one of the narratives that are going around in Brussels. Uh, I think the obstacles to that, um, uh, they, they have, I mean, they, 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 they haven't changed in the last 50 or 60 years. I think the, if you look at France and Germany, for instance, which would be critical to any enterprise aimed at furthering European uh, defense cooperation, uh, the, 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 those two countries, uh, as, as you know, they have a very different understanding of military power. They have a very different attitude towards military force. The, the French look at the military as not only as, a, as, a, as, a, as an instrument for defense and deterrence, but also as a foreign policy instrument. They make an active use of the military to advance their foreign policy and their economic objectives around the world. They make a very proactive use of, of military force for political and economic purposes. I think Germany, correct me if I'm wrong, rejects that interpretation and looks at the military as a, as a last resort defense instrument. So those are very, very strong uh, differences of strategic culture. And, and it's not just about culture. I mean, those differences project over any discussions you have on capabilities, on strategic, on strategic concepts, that makes it very difficult to speak of, of, to speak of a European defense. And I don't think Trump can, I don't, I don't think Trump can change that. I'm just not sure Trump can change that. Or Brexit for that matter. Mm. Can the EU change that? Because I think what the EU is trying to do on the defense side goes a bit more in the direction of the French. Huh? <coughs> and German military and defense views might have changed over the past 10, 15 years, at least yeah. in some terms. Are there other questions? Um, yes, please. More importantly, I think former President Obama w would have agreed with you. He tried to make a pivot to Asia, um, and he tried to reset the but uh, button uh, r relationship with Russia, and neither one really worked out. Uh, we had Crimea, we had the Ukraine, we have concerns about Estonia and Latvia maybe, but we no longer fear a Russian interest in Germany or invading Paris or something like that. So we don't worry about the Russians so much anymore. And, 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 and really, instead of pivoting to Asia, the, the most that Trump is con really concerned about is North Korea for, for many good reasons. But that's not where the, the, the real power is these days. It, 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 it's more than that. Instead, our policy has primarily focused on the Middle East. That's where our real concern uh, has been even under President uh, Obama. So I, I, I'm hoping that your rational interpretation of US policy is right, but I'm afraid under Trump, it's mercurial, it's unpredictable, it's, it's almost irrational uh, so far. And, and so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you would comment on, on a mercurial US foreign policy mm -hmm. uh, 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 instead of a rational one. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much for that, and thank you for pulling me back into reality, uh, if if you will. Uh, because I mean, I, I agree with with everything you're saying. I mean, I think. I mean, I think. Having said that, I mean, as as, as I was trying, I mean, the problem when you talk about you know this, these things from a sort of big picture perspective is that you get very superficial and you don't get down into the into the details. You're right. I mean, the, the, the demand signal for U.S. military activity in the Middle East or in Europe is not going to go down 
It's not going to go down anytime soon. And in fact, the opposite is happening, both in Eastern Europe and in particular, as you say now, in the Middle East. Uh, however, um, the sort of resources that the U.S. is devoting now to the Middle East and Europe, they, are, are they really that significant? Uh, yes, it's in the news, uh, it, gets a, it gets political attention, and so on and so forth. But if you look at the sort of you know, military posture that the U.S. has in the Middle East and in Europe, it's much less hands-on than it used to be in both theaters. I think the pivot to Asia, and which it, it has been criticized under Obama, I mean, it was, I mean, there were a lot of people in, 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 in D.C. in the think tanks and, and the expert community, as you know, saying that the pivot you know, was all talk but no walk. And there, there's something to that, I agree, especially if you, look at, if, if, if you look at it through the lens of U.S. force posture. I mean, has the U.S. really shifted that many uh, permanent assets to the Asia-Pacific theater of operations? Not really. There were like four literal combat uh, ships sent to Singapore, uh, a bunch of Marines to Australia, and, uh, and, and, that's about, and that's about it, really. But then if you look at other structures, like, for instance, uh, getting Japan to do more, uh, empowering Japan, revising the, uh, the bilateral U.S.-Japan defense guidelines, uh, working with Japan on missile defense, with, working with Japan and Korea on missile defense, and also if you look at uh, long-term force, uh, for, uh, force structure and force planning at, at the Pentagon, like the third offset strategy and all the innovation-related initiatives that the Pentagon has, they're all framed by China and by the need to defeat China in a Western Pacific theater of operations uh, uh, context. I think events and real life events will slow, uh, will slow th this down. And I think precedent, individual precedents do matter. H having said that, and try trying to think about this from a sort of long haul perspective, I, I, I think this is happening and this will happen. Uh, because uh, that's where U.S. economic interests are, and that's the center of gravity of, of, of power in the world. And I, I think there are very strong constituencies in Washington, economic, political, in the think tanks, that, that support this wholeheartedly, and, 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 and this cuts across party lines. And I think this has very serious implications for Europe, and for U.S. policy in Europe, and for European security more broadly, and for the European geopolitical structure more broadly. Thank you. Look, looking again at the maybe last point on our title, Protests on the Rise, and the many European crises that you res resumed in a balance of power crisis, does this matter to the people on the streets, to those who are protesting, who are running behind, really, it's some ideology against, against the open society, against liberalism, protect yourself, against TTIP, CETA, and whatever you like, uh, parts of... European societies are very pro-Russian, uh, parts of them uh, who are uh, trying to brandish the European institutions and politicians in general as the elite. Uh, does, does, this, does this fit with the balance of power crisis? Well, I think, I mean, I think they yeah. might not be, I mean, uh, this sort of populism-related crisis might not be interested in, 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 in great power politics, but great power <coughs> politics is interested, in, uh, and great powers are interested in these dynamics to the extent that they can act as transmission belts for their own, for their own strategies. No, uh, I think, uh, I, I, if, if you allow me the comparison, I think it was Plato who said, you might not be interested in the republic, but the republic is interested in you. No, or, you know, or even Clausewitz, you might not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And I say that only to say that, um, that for instance, just to give you an example, like linking to uh, some of the themes that you alluded to, uh, uh, for instance, Russia, in order to, to expand its power, it does draw on populism, and, 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 and it does try to connect uh, 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 discursively with some of the populist elements that you have in Central and Eastern European countries. And, and, and by doing that, it empowers them and it makes that picture wrong. So there, there, I mean, there are a lot of ways in which the two levels communicate, I think. Uh, and, and yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think whoever has another question, I think we hold this back to after Mr. The Professor Schneider's presentation, please. Okay. Professor Schneider. Thank you. I need the PowerPoint. This one? Yes. Good. 
So again, good afternoon. And thank you, the organizers. I thank the organizers for the invitation without naming them personally. <clears throat> but we know who are the people, real people behind the, the organization of this conference. And uh, my presentation, which is a bit more theoretical, different than Professor uh, Simons, is called Coping with War, Economic Crisis and Migration, which is a very nice way to say what do we do about the refugees. It's a title that uh, expresses a um, deeper fear about our futures. And I will say that it is difficult to measure the impact of war in any given society, since it depends not only in the intensity of fighting, use of different kinds of weapons, length of the fighting period, and other empirical factors, but also on the stage of development of the country affected, the state and society resources employed in defending the population, and cultural traditions about war. Meaning war means different things in different places. War can be defined as an armed conflict between societies, within societies, or a combination of both, which is the most common uh, type of war in the last decades. Richard Smiley, a, Nobel Prize of, a former Nobel Prize of Chemistry, has defined war as the sixth most important problem, together with terrorism, between the ten main issues that affect human life nowadays. And the issues are energy, problems of energy, water problems, food problems, environment problems, poverty problems, terrorism and war, number six, disease problems, education problems, problems with democracy, and problems with population. Looking at the list, it is clear that all the problems mentioned are interlinked in a cause-effect, cause relationship. The military theoretical aspect of this assessment has been developed in the 1930s by Erich von Ludendorff when he enunciated his theory about total war that influenced perceptions and attitudes towards the Second World War and more so afterwards. For the purposes of this work, the main signification of the total war theory is that the war affected societies uh, are affected by a phenomenon from which there is no escape within the society at war, but escape from it, meaning looking for a refuge place outside the area of war, generating waves of migration but by refugees of war. In between actual war and migration, generally we also find deep socioeconomic crises related to the infrastructural damages, economic paralysis, disinvestment, unemployment, high rates of inflation, and lack of shelters, lack of food and medicine, and disarticulation of any normal life. This is my description of war nowadays, but I'll try to go a little bit uh, deeper into it. This economic critical situation compound, to together with the immediate danger of loss of life, personal and family physical damage and the psychosocial impact of total lack of security, constitutes strong incentive incentives for migration and seeking a refugee status or asylum somewhere not affected by war. The research question of this paper is about the causes of massive migrations of refugees and what can nation states, regional organizations, European Union and some others, and the United Nations do in order to alleviate the multiple problems that such waves of migration create in the host countries. Let's call them, meanwhile, host countries. If we take the 10 most important problems affecting humanity and we link them to war economic crisis situations, we can state that refugee migrants will try to reach places where energy, water, and food provision are safe and regular. 
they'll try to settle in places that are safe from an, uh, uh, from an environmental point of view and allow them economic opportunities to overcome poverty. They will try to get as far as possible from war areas or hardly hit by terror areas to areas not affected by massive, by massive diseases, to democratic places where education is accessible and are not hostile and too crowded. Now the problem starts. Because this combination of ideal places for refugee migrants leaves us with not a long list of Western European countries, North American countries, two of them, and the Australian democracies. This is it, more or less. According to the model of what people look in order to solve their problem created by war. If to this we add the problem of accessibility, and most of the refugee migrants today come from Western and Central Asia and Africa, the list is further reduced to Western European democracies since Australia and North America are far away and difficult to reach for poor migrants. Therefore, one of the research questions should be why and how do Western European democracies a category extended uh, to the European Union in general and Great Britain react to the problems of refugee migrants affecting them. Although moral, consideration, uh, moral considerations play a part in the political decision-making process, the issue of refugee migration is so complex from this point of view that in this work it should be left undealt. In an ideal world, wherever people are in danger and suffer, uh, they should be saved and helped by those that are in a better situation. Still, ours is far from being an ideal world, especially from the political and economic point of view, as we have heard now. Moreover, modern public means of communication unintendedly play with human tragedy and generate public opinion waves moved by crude reporting of the most terrible tragedies, especially when they play into the emotions and fears of the public. This, uh, the case of the use of, chem uh, of chemical weapons against the civil population of Idlib in Syria and its vicinity at the beginning of April this year, 2017, serves as an example. In a country where in six years of civil and international war, more than half a million people have been killed without generating uh, a great outcry that was generated by the use of chemical weapons, you should ask yourself whether the public opinion and political reaction that followed the chemical attacks are not a massive demonstration of cynicism. See, because what's the difference between a child killed by a chemical weapon and a child killed by a bomb or a bullet? At least in my mind. Research is being conducted for already many decades in the issue of migration and refugees, and again, in an ideal world, the results of these researches should be used to generate the best possible poli policies to deal with the complexity of these issues. Moreover, since the problem of migration refugees are massive and are caused by well-known phenomena, the effort to alleviate and solve them should also be massive, regionally and internationally, and coordinated in order to obtain the best possible results from the decisions taken, policies applied, and resources invested. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, and I'll call them UNHCR, is confronting the problem of refugees together with many local organizations, but the scope of the issue, according to the UN, UNHRC, CRRC, CR, I say, sources is far out of any international institutional and financial capabilities to tackle with it. Dealing with more than 65 million of displaced people all over the world, internally and internationally displaced, UNHCR addresses the issue of more of 21 million refugees, 
as of today. Of these, 5.2 million are Palestinian refugees that are being supported by UNRWA in refugee camps in the Middle East since 1948, and 16.1 uh, million are under the mandate of UN, uh, UNHCR. 10 million are stateless people and more than 170,000 were resettled, 107,000, sorry, which is nothing, have been resettled in 2015. UNHCR estimates its budget needs for 2015 at $7,232 million, but actually, they spent 3,295, which is less than half of that sum. For 2017, the needs are of $7,451 million, of which now, now we are in the middle of 2017, only uh, 1,958 million are available. I wanted to show you if I find the little, oh, here it is. Two or three figures, oh, sorry. This is, you see, this speaks by itself. If you know to read statistics, oh, and this is very simple statistics, this is comics statistics. I think there is no need to, oh, what did I do? Uh -huh, yeah. I did it wrong. Look at the numbers. Look at the historic development of the refugee problem. Look at the numbers of people being displaced by war. And we are talking now about more than 60, 61, I said millions. And look at the European refugee crisis if you like maps. And then you are starting to get the picture of the magnitude of the problem uh, I am trying to talk about. The problem with humanitarian support for migrant <coughs> refugees is that the institutions that deal with them are tackling the consequences <coughs> of a worldwide phenomenon without trying to address the causes of it. The causes are complex but well known. War and warlike situations endanger human lives by directing violence against civilians. Statistics show that Total war and the globalization of wars added to the mixture of civil wars and wide international intervention, as well as adding to the wars against terror that, that in a, uh, an almost natural way operates from inside civilian groups of people. That, and these uh, phenomena are hitting mainly civilians. In the last decades, 85 to 90 percent of the victims of war are civilians. If to this we add the economic disarticulation produced by war situations and all it involves, it is clear that masses of civilians will migrate from war zones looking for refuge in safer areas and will try to migra migrate towards places that offer an antinomy in life terms, as mentioned before. Wars do not seem to be recessing, but they are changing in shape from what Mary Caldors calls to what Mary Caldors calls new wars that are different from old wars in the following ways. I'll give you a short list, and afterwards, those interested will give me email address and I'll send you the paper. Actors. Old wars were fought by regular armed forces of states. New wars are fought by a varying combination of networks of state and non-state actors, regular armed forces, private security contractors, mercenaries, jihadists, warlords, paramilitaries, and so forth. The larger the number of factors and the less institutionalized they are, or wars are, dealing with wars becomes more difficult. Goals. Old wars were fought for geopolitical interests or for ideology, democracy or socialism, etc., etc. New wars are fought in the name of identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, tribal identities, and a lot of others. 
Identity politics has a different logic from geopolitics or ideology. The aim is to gain access to the state for particular groups that may be both local or transnational, rather than to carry out particular policies or programs in the broader public interest. The rise of identity politics is associated with new communication technologies, with migration both from country to town and across the world, and the erosion of more inclusive political ideologies like socialism and post-colonial nationalism. Perhaps most importantly, identity politics is constructed through war. Thus, political mobilizations around identity is the aim of war rather than an instrument of war, as was the case in the old wars. Methods. In old wars, battle was the decisive encounter. The method of waging war consisted of capturing territory through military means. In the new wars, battles are rare and territory is captured through political means, through controls, control or controlling population. A typical technique is population displacement, the forcible removal of those with a different identity or different opinions. Violence is largely directed against civilians, as I said before, as a way of controlling territory rather than against enemy forces. Forms of finance. Old wars were largely financed by states through taxations or by outside patrons, loans, etc., etc. In weak states, tax revenue is falling and new forms of predatory private finance include loot and pillage, taxation of humanitarian aid. They stop caravans of humanitarian aid by force and take a tax out of them. Uh, diaspora support, kidnapping, smuggling, oil and anything else you can imagine, diamonds, drugs, smuggling people. These are the new features of war and we should be aware of them. Uh, it is sometimes argued that new wars are motivated by economic gain, but it is difficult to distinguish between those who use power of uh, political violence for economic reasons and those who engage in predatory economic activities to finance their political cause. You see, the cause effect works in various directions. Whereas all war economies were typically centralizing autarkic and mobilized the population and mobilized the population. New wars are part of an open, globalized, decentralized economy in which participation is low and revenue depends on continued violence. The features of the new type of wars are the virtual disappearance of war between states. We don't see now wars with be between states. The decline of all high and intensity wars involving more than a thousand battle deaths. The decline in the deadliness of war measured in terms of battle death, the increase in the duration and recurrence of wars, and the risk factor of proximity to another war, of being near a war. What happens with you when you are near a war? Chaotic ground war, or more technically, militarized occupation, continues to prevail in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and are globally impacted. In Bosnia and Kosovo, where theoretically there is peace now, they are still rebuilding their devastated social infra infrastructures with limited support. In North Korea and the Taiwan Straits, new tensions are developing. In sub-Saharan Africa, conflict is endemic. In short, the application of massive intervention forces has not brought about a positive peace anywhere, and long simmering conflicts such as Kashmir are intensifying as two more states develop weapons of totalizing defense, meaning nuclear weapons. Two minutes. So if I have two minutes, I will jump to the conclusions uh, almost directly, because I have more than two minutes uh, to read in the paper, and we'll tell you that there are two things that should be thought about or addressed now. The first is that uh, 
it's very difficult to cope with wars, but it is possible to cope with wars. And the reason it is possible to cope with wars is in the numbers. Because we ask ourselves, you see, this is a good example of humanitarian aid by military means. Which is the Italians in the Mediterranean. We laugh always about the Italians, but they are doing a jolly good job in saving people that would be dead if the Italian fleet that can't now fight against, I don't know which other fleet in the world, save them. You know? So this, this I put as a, if you want, an anecdote. And here you have the problem of displaced people in wars. See, people, Europe has a problem with refugees, but the real problem is not in Europe. The real problem is in the countries that are neighbors of the conflict areas. The real problem is in Turkey and in Jordan and in Lebanon, where most of the refugees of Syria go, in Pakistan and Iran, where most of the refugees of Afghanistan go, in Africa, where from one country they pass, they pass to another country, and all these are non-developed countries. I don't want to use the underdeveloped uh, uh, ticket non-developed countries that are feeble state structures. And if these countries are not aid, are not supported by the richer countries, what will probably happen is that the uh, failing state uh, uh, phenomena of the countries that are cracking under war, like Syria, like Iraq and Afghanistan, will happen in their periphery, and then you'll have in Europe really massive migration. Therefore, my personal conclusion is the following. Let's see. You see, this is the state of Syrian economy. Look what happened to the Syrian economy when war intensifies. You see, and a country without an economy is an, a failing country. State doesn't work anymore. People are completely unsafe, and they'll try to run away. And this is what happened them, and this is what happened in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Central Africa, in Central America, with the um, drug wars and the civil wars, etc., etc. Now the point is, where do we take the money? We still live the aftershock of a big recession, big world recession, and the only place where money can be found in budgets, it's in military budgets nowadays. And the logics of taking money from military budgets to pour into trying to solve wars, to uh, placate wars, to reduce the level of wars, is very simple. The kind of weaponry that is being bought mostly with these huge uh, budgets will be probably useless in future wars because the nature of war has changed and you will not fight, or we are not fighting wars with aircraft carriers, with big fleets of bombers, with intercontinental missiles. We are seeing other kind of wars being fought. And these wars are being fed by the economies of these places and fed weapon by these places that happen to be the major producers of weapons that are used in the peripheral and local wars. So it is up to the, well, this you can read, but it's not important. It says what I said before, that there are 15 countries in the world that spend 89% of the money that it spent uh, in uh, military weaponry. Look at the distribution, the USA alone is 40% of the expenditure in uh, military expenses in the world, and the rest are all developed countries. The non-developed areas of the world that spend, spend very little money comparatively. So if these countries want to continue being developed, rich, progress, etc., they have to think about their military expenditure and what to do about those that are really coping today with the refugee prog uh, problem, which are the neighboring states of the conflict areas. See, I don't know if you looked at TV, but yesterday night in uh, one of the channels here, they showed something about Yemen. In Yemen, children population are dying by the minute because of the war that's going on there. 
And if nothing is done in this uh, area, what will happen, and I am not on uh, prophecies, of course, but the logical development will be more failing states, more refugees, more pressures on the developed world, and more violence. I think it is time to awake. And it's not only, as I said before, uh, it's not only a humanitarian problem. It's a problem of simple logics and convenience. If the world wants to stay the way it is up to now and start solving things, this problem should be immediately addressed. Sorry for, for being so pessimist, but I was asked to think about this, and when I saw the numbers, I felt uh, appalled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Schneider. Very interesting. Again, after a very focused US perspective um, on the EU crisis, defining it as a balance of power crisis, um, we had now a very interesting view on the couple war and refugees with the definition of new wars and its elements. Mm -hmm. Very striking, I think 80 to 90 percent of war victims are civilians, 65 million displaced, the issue yeah. of migration flows and where are the ideal places for refugees. But then, I think pessimistic but also a bit optimistic, you said it's, it's possible to cope with the war. Yeah. Uh, you looked at the Italian border guards and the good job they do, I think, also with support of the European Union. Uh, and the real problem, which is in neighboring countries, it's true. Uh, if you look about, around Syria, the numbers that the European Union has received in terms of Syrian refugees is ridiculous compared to the numbers that have been received by Jordan, Turkey, and the like. Um, and it's true that the root causes need to be addressed but also how to help those countries in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And with permission, this is exactly the approach that we try to promote. We say we have to help those countries in the neighborhood, and the deal between the European Union and Turkey is certainly not ideal and can be debated, but the money, we, will do, we don't give it to the Turkish government. We give it to intermediary non-governmental organizations okay. like the UNHCR, who improve the living conditions of the refugees on the ground, education, health care, food, and the like. And finally, budgets, military budgets, the big pots where the money can, could come from. And this is exactly what we also discussed with our American friends, with Trump. Uh, we underlined that it's not about the 2% of NATO spending alone. Security also comes through development aid and through this type of spending. And there we are way ahead of the United States. So I think this needs to be put together in the same discussion about war, the right answers to them, and the refugee crisis.